Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 30th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really mean it. I have a lot to cover. So, well, I'm actually out of Mountain Dew once again. <clears throat> I got to remember, excuse me, I have to remember to go to the store. But um, I think I should be able to get everything in without being jacked up on the dew. There's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up real quick for you. Our predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff. Can happen between now and then. If you're really bored, you can go read the disclaimer on my website, DaveLandry.com. But I doubt that you have that much time. I doubt that you have that much time. Hey, we got a sponsor this week, the Centrifugal Sats Clock. Check that out. That's our sponsor this week. All right, what we talk about? Well, I woke up thinking about based on the, the recent dead money report that I put in my column on Wednesday. I woke up thinking about money management being statistical or psychological, and I'll flesh that out in just one minute. And we also have a dead money report. Um, we should have plenty enough time to cover some other topics if you guys would like, and usually we always tend to go off on anything. So if anything you want me to cover, uh, feel free to, to, to throw it out at any particular time during the show. And uh, if hold off on stock picks for now just so we um, – we don't get those mixed up with everything. Once we do get to the charts and I open it up for stock picks, you can ask about as many stocks as you want. Just uh, do me a favor and ask about a stock and hit enter and then ask about another one if you want. You can ask about as many as you want. Just make sure you hit enter in between each one. That way I can delete it after I cover it uh, out of fairness to everyone else. And it's also difficult for me to keep up. Anyway, enough of that uh, housekeeping. I think let's just uh, – probably the best thing to do is just jump right in. <clears throat> so a while back I was asked, is your money management and position management psychological or statistical? And my answer to that question was yes. It's psychological in the need for instant gratification. We live in this microwave society, as I say uh, quite often, where we're expecting these immediate results. Uh, I hate having a cell phone. Basically, a cell phone for me is a way for people to get in touch with me uh, because they need something, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it's like so if I leave the house, when I, which I rarely do, but if I leave the house, the office, have you a look at it, um, my wife could call me to tell me to pick up some groceries or run an errand or get lunch or whatever the case may be. And if someone texts us, it's like we're expecting this this instant response back. It's like you text someone, oh, I texted them 10 seconds ago. They didn't respond back. Well, I mean, that obviously I don't want to digress too far, but obviously if you're driving somewhere, you shouldn't be looking at your text and you shouldn't be trying to answer those texts. But people expect you to answer right away. And that's just the, the type of society we have become where everything is instant. And as I've said quite before, uh, quite a bit before, you can't even – you can't even go to a video store anymore. I think there's one within about a 50 mile radius of my house that's still in existence. It's probably a it's probably a, a front for crack or something, but uh, <laughs> or some kind of drugs. But most of the video stores went out of business because people don't have enough energy to go drive to a video store anymore. They want the instant gratification. They want to be able to download it and or watch it on a computer as well. The case may be. So that's the society we live in, and we've always been wanting things as quickly as possible, but I think now in today's fast-paced society, there's even more pressure. So there's a, definitely a need to be right and be right quick. Now, if things work out properly, like I have in this little textbook example here, this is taken from the Layman's Guide for Trading in Stocks. I think you guys have seen this quite a bit. But we're taking that little swing trade out real quickly, that little uh, swing trade profit out real quickly. And if things work well, within a few days, it hits. Obviously, it doesn't always work that well, but sometimes it does. And sometimes within the first day or two, you actually get that, that instant gratification that you're looking for. You want to be right, and you want to be right quick. We all have that urge within us, again, especially not to beat the dead horse in today's society. And the other thing it does is it – you get a better than a poke in the eye reward or a mediocre trade. So let's say a market just rallies a little bit and then implodes. Well, at least you got that better than a poke in the eye, which we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to have a little revisit to that in just one second on those mediocre trades. In other words, the, tr the trade that only turns into a swing trade and then comes right back in. 
Uh, longer term, we have this this ego, and I don't want to get into Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it, it comes with that self-actualization and fulfillment and everything else. And I think when you get into the longer term uh, trend following and, and being right longer term, getting in a position and riding it out for months and months and months and making a lot of money on that position, I think that helps our longer term ego need to be right. And it's a good feeling to be in a good position for a long, long time. And the hybrid approach of combining the swing trading with the longer term trading helps. And I use the word helps in here. Make sure this word is, uh, this is the key word in this sentence. But it helps to mitigate the painful drawdowns. And as I've said quite a bit, let's say you want to stay with this position for hopefully six months. Okay. Well, your stop is going to have to be way down here based on the volatility of the stock as you project that forward, as you see me do this before with like a, uh, what do you call it, a parabola, an odds cone or a parabola cone based on historical volatility. If you predict going back in time the volatility of the market, it's either going to be way up here or way down here, at least on a statistical basis, based on its behavior in the past. So first of all, you're going to have to have a really wide stop way down here. And then second, if you're not taking any profits along the way, when this thing begins to implode, which sooner or later it will, it's going to, your equity curve is going to really take a dive, a nose dive, especially because you're going to have a full position on. Furthermore, your chances, obviously you're going to get stopped out quite a bit at these big wide stops. And your chances of being right aren't really that big longer term. Now, every trade that we go into, we feel like, we have the potential to capture a longer term winner. But the reality is the percentage wise, and if memory serves, I think it's about 28%. We have a 28% of capturing that nice longer term winner. And that's, that's great. And that's fantastic. But if you're just trading for longer term winners and you're not taking any shorter term profits, then you're going to be wrong probably about three quarters of the time. So psychologically, that could be tough. So the little short term profit helps to kind of feed that short term need. And the when I'm talking about drawdowns in, in this particular case, I'm talking about the pain associated with a drawdown, a deep drawdown. Some of these trend following systems I read where one said they had like a 70 percent drawdown. It's like, well, you can't live through that. You can't live through a 50 percent drawdown. That's way too much because once you hit 50 percent, as you know, you got to make back 100% of your money, and it only grows geometrically as you go further and further into the hole. So that's very hard to recover from, not only from a statistical standpoint, but also, of course, from a psychological standpoint. So the psychological aspects of taking partial profit, again, just to recap, gets it, it feels that that shorter term need to be right. It, it gives you some money on the trades that, that don't pan out. And if they do pan out, it, it gives you the longer term. It feeds that longer term ego for being right. And then also, it helps to mitigate the drawdowns. Now, you can still make a lot of money with only a half a position on. And obviously, you still will have some drawdowns when that position stops out. But it won't be nearly as bad drawdown-wise if – you're taking off if you've taken off half of the position. Now, even half of the position is plenty big enough for you to have a really good year if you catch just a few good winners. Now, shorter term, you're keeping the risk in line. Again, it's kind of they're kind of uh, they're kind of interwoven as I as I'm talking out here. But instead of having your stop way down here, your stop is a little bit tighter, okay, or a lot tighter in here. So you're not risking as much going in. Now, I know we do compensate with the number of shares. But if you go as far as to compensate on a number of shares with that very, very wide stop, then you're going to be trading fewer and fewer shares. So you actually end up, and I'm just kind of thinking about this as I'm talking it out, and this is why I love uh, the teaching aspect of my business, The you're going to have fewer shares alone in order to get your money management right. So a lot of people say, well, you know, Dave, you do this longer term trend following, but you're exiting half of your shares right here. OK, but think about it is if you're playing this as a swing trade, you're going to have a lot more shares on 
than if you're playing it as a longer term trade. I never thought about that until now. So that answers uh, another question when it comes to the money and position management. So I need to flesh that out. Uh, thank you guys for being here. Let me do this. Let me uh, kind of go through this um, mental process here. Now, you're able to capture some gains on short-term trades that follow through or some gains on some trades that follow through shorter term, but no, but not longer term. So let's say it comes here, comes back in a few times in a row. Well, if you're trading for longer term gains, you're going to get stopped out at a big loss, okay, even if you do compensate for more shares. And then let's say it does it again, stopped out for a big loss, does it again, stopped out for a big loss. Well, at least this way, you're taking short-term profits and you're putting something in your pocket and then you're stopping out at a scratch. Now, a lot of people say, well, Dave, why don't you take 100% here when this happens one, two, three, or even four times in a row? And the reason is because the real money is in the longer-term trend. The more a market moves, the more money you will make. Unfortunately, it takes a while, usually, for the market to move a long ways. So it's interesting, and I've said this quite a few times, so you guys bear with me, we've been here for a while. When we have trade after trade after trade that goes up, we get a swing trade scratch, swing trade scratch, accuracy goes through the roof, which is phenomenal, which is great, don't get me wrong, but I'd rather be a little bit less accurate and make a lot more money. I'd rather be right than make money. And that's a whole nother conversation, but that's a problem that a lot of people have is they'd rather be right than make a lot of money and they don't realize that but that human ego causes them to think that way and that's where the psychology comes back in if you are taking that swing trade profit and then stop it at least you're getting something and at least you're getting some reward out of the trade now it's not my way or highway and i see some questions coming in so we'll uh i'll be happy to entertain those but this is the best that i've found at least for me uh, your mileage may vary and you might want to do things a, a different way and then uh just to close a loop on this and conversely let's say we have three positions in a row to do this uh, the uh, market conditions are fantastic everyone asks me well dave why not just keep on 100 percent so you make even more money okay well you don't know you don't know if you're going to get this or this so this is why you, you take profits here and then you hold on for longer term gain also if you do hold on Longer term like this, yeah, you'll make more money, but also your drawdowns are going to be pretty steep when that market does correct and when you finally do stop out of a trade. I don't want to dive, uh, I don't want to go too far off of the tangent, but the epiphany I had oh, a few months ago was every trade ends badly. It's like, uh, who was it, uh, George Carlin once said, or somebody once said, when you buy a pet, it's going to end badly, okay? <laughs> so eventually it's going to end badly. So no matter how great a trade, in the end, you're going to have to give up some profits. It's going to end badly. And you have to wrap your head around that, that every trade is going to end badly. Either you're going to get stopped out or you're going to make a little bit of profit and then give up the remainder of that. Or the best of both worlds, as I always preach from a hybrid approach, you're going to swing trade profit out, you trail a stop. But in the end, your stop is going to be nice and wide and you're riding at that longer term trend. And, yes, you will have to give up some of those gains. But so what? And, um... You know, it turned out to be a pretty good book. I was a little skeptical of these turtle books, but uh, the one by, I think it's Curtis Faith, The Way of the Turtle, it's right here in my bookshelf. I can, my um, headset no longer reaches, so I can't go grab books like I used to. That's a bummer. But um, anyway, in that book, uh, Dennis treated the, the drawdowns to open profits as um, differently than he did to drawdowns that were just plain old losses. So it's kind of like something that you accept what you trade you accept the fact that you're going to give up some of those gains and it just comes with the territory does it suck yes am i interviewing myself yes <laughs> like john mccain he often interviews himself which is funny um but i don't want to digress too far anyway so you're able to capture sub gains on trades that follow through shorter term but not longer term and you don't get rich by doing this, but it does keep you in the game. Seems like, uh, I don't remember when it was. It was either early this year or a while back. We had a phenomenal accuracy rate, but nothing really panned out, okay? Uh, we make a little bit, stop out, make a little bit, stop out, make a little bit, stop out. But those accuracy stats look phenomenal. But I would much rather have those accuracy, accuracy stats just kind of like fall through the roof 
and be right on fewer trades, but be right big on those few trades that work out and make a lot more money. Again, it comes back to being right versus making money. But the beauty of it is you do you don't get rich, but it keeps you in the game. So you you make a little scratch, make a little scratch, make a little scratch. And at least your equity curve is going up, or if you hit a few losses in between, it flattens out. You know, so your equity curve does this. But the good thing is, eventually the market will begin to trend again, or those particular sectors will begin to trend again, and you'll start catching some big winners again. So the longer you can stay in this game, the better your chances are of success. And taking those short-term profits and stopping out on the remainder, if it happens, okay, will keep you in the game for quite a while until things really improve. Now, uh, you know, getting back to like the market wizards, I think it was Jimmy Rogers said uh, intuition, intuition versus into wishing. OK, so if you do start getting chewed up a little bit and you're able to say, well, wait a minute, let me really look at these stocks. Let me see what the overall market zone. Oh, the S&P 500 hasn't made any forward progress on a net net basis since last November, all the way way back around Thanksgiving. So maybe I need to be very selective in my stock picking, okay? So you become more and more selective, taking on fewer and fewer positions, and your equity curve flatlines, but you just kind of bide your time. You wait for this to happen again. Wait for that next trend to ensue, okay? And again, here's the most important thing, and one of the most important thing, things, it's all important, but it does allow for the longer-term gains, again, which are vitally important, okay? If you're, let's say you're trading a 100K account, okay, and you're doing 2% per trade, well, you're going to have a 2% loss on one or two, that I can guarantee. And then if you take partial profits and scratch out, you have a 1% gain, okay? Now, again, you're not making – you're making only half of what you're losing, but eventually you're going to have some sort of percentage that, in theory, could be infinity, okay? I guess it would be infinity percentage. Now, we've had this conversation before, but let's say on a two, this is 2K, okay, $2,000. So minus 2,000, and then let's say plus 1,000, and then you have another trade where you make 1,000, okay? So now you pretty much scratch. Then let's say you lose again, 2,000. Well, now you're underwater a little bit. But then let's say you get one that really takes off and you make thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on just one trade, actually just one half of a trade. You make one K in the first loaf because you're taking those partial profits. And then you make some big number on the remainder. Now, this doesn't happen every day. But when conditions are really well, it can happen, okay? We could go into like a blow off type of move in the overall market. And you could you could enter what I call the print money phase. I was uh by a good friend Peter Mothy. Um I spoke in Dallas on, on his invite to um the uh Dallas Technical Technical Analysis uh well, I forget their exact name. Uh, I can't believe it escapes me. But anyway, uh a a, a society over there based on technical analysis. And, you know, afterwards he gave me a few little critiques on my speech, and he says, you can't use the word streaky. It sounds too elusive. But I don't have a better way of explaining it other than just saying flat out that trend following can be a little streaky. And the, the, the real money does come in streaks. But if you chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away at it, it will happen. Like last week or week before, someone asked, you know, what if it takes seven or eight months? It's like, well, so what if it takes seven or eight months, okay? We're in this for the long haul, and I often tell people in the service, and that's why I discount the longer-term subscription so much because I want people to stick with it long enough to reap the fruits of their labor, to capture some of these bigger, longer-term winners. So it does take time, and this can be a little elusive out here. Again, I probably shouldn't. Um, beat the dead horse about how elusive it is, but it does happen. And it does seem to happen just enough to keep you in the game. Now, if it starts happening a lot, what happens is, of course, uh, the, the freshman psychology rears his ugly head. And then you start feeling like God and you forget that you forget about those times where you just had to grind it out. 
and you have to realize that it won't last forever. Once you've been around the block a time or two, the thing that's a little perverse about this in, it, uh, industry, and, and again, I think somebody at the market with us uh, talked about that too. It's like you go through about three months where you're absolutely on fire and you think you're God, okay? Unfortunately, if you've been around the block a time or two, when you feel like, when you're feeling that God-like complex, you're like, uh-oh, I'm getting ready to get whacked. And you don't know when it's going to come. And it's like you're kind of like worried about when that's going to happen, okay? And then three months out of a year, you're cold. And I forget who said it. If somebody knows who said it, I think it was in the first Market Wizards. And you're so cold, you can't hit the side of the barn, and you wonder what's wrong with you. Well, the good thing is, the way I've adjusted for that in my methodology is, I just start trading less and less and less, and I become more and more selective. And I really look hard at those indices. Like I said, I think in my first book, I went to a TAG conference, Technical Analysis Group. I'm showing my age, um, which is the old Comp CompuTrack uh, uh, seminars. I think they're now... They've since become, uh, that's where the Traders Expo comes from, is those old TAG conferences. And it's kind of like a pinch me moment. I don't think about it. It's like I've actually spoken at quite a few of those Traders Expos, and I'm speaking in Vegas uh, coming up. But I was like a little meager attendee uh, back in the uh, early 90s, I guess, somewhere around then. And uh, I had some initial success very early on, some very incredible success with my trading. And then all of a sudden, I, could hit, I couldn't hit the side of the barn. And, and I'm like, what the hell's wrong with me? So I just kind of uh, became friendly with a guy. And uh, I started pouring my heart out to him. Like, oh, I can't catch a trend to save my life. And he's like, well, are you plotting the S&P? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, it ain't going anywhere in four months. And I'm like, oh. So it just kind of hit me, like hit me the head like a halibut. Like, wow, okay, so that's what's going on. So anyway, you will grind it out for a while. But if you're taking partial profits, and you're stopping out, and you're getting stopped out when you um, when you just flat out have bad trades, and you're becoming very selective, then that drawdown will come, but at least you're going to mitigate it. And on the flip side, on the good side, the good problem to have is when you're printing money, yes, the drawdown will still come, but by trailing those stops higher, and then by putting on new positions at the meantime and everything, you'll help to mitigate those drawdowns as opposed to longer term trend following which is going to be one not very accurate and two deep drawdowns okay uh question maybe for future webinar how do full-time smart full-time small home traders deal with loneliness um I don't know if I've had a problem with that uh, because I'm so busy. I keep myself so busy. It's like I almost want to be left alone. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's a good thing. But just keep yourself busy. Uh, I, I, years ago, uh, someone said something about enjoying their own company, and, and, and that's kind of me. I kind of amuse myself uh, when I'm when I'm not um, when I'm not uh, in front of my screens and working in my office. Uh, but I would keep yourself busy with projects and research and, and just get lost in your research and get lost in, in, in that kind of stuff. And if you don't feel like doing any research or whatever, then then I would pursue some sort of hobby or do something to keep you busy. I'm, I'm talking with someone now and they're a very busy individual and they're going to grad school and they're doing all these different things. And, and they've got some really good ideas about some uh, some altruistic things they want to do with their life. And it's just a you know, phenomenal type of person. And but it's like. They're just so busy. They're like, I'm not going to have time to trade, but I really want to trade. I'm like, you're a perfect candidate for trading because you're going to do the right thing, and you're not going to sit there and try to make something happen out of boredom, okay? Busy traders make good traders. And I learned that early on when when um, many years ago. I might have been working on my first book. It's like a – Started going through a drawdown, and I tried to. I was trying to climb myself out of the drawdown, but I was. Then I got busy working on the book, and I reached a point where I was like, "This trading is actually losing me money." And this book, I'm really busy working on it. And boy, I tell you what, uh, you know, the stress from losing money is is not letting me finish the book. And it's like, and then all of a sudden, I was like, "Well, wait a minute, I'm not really following my own plan anymore because I'm too busy trying to climb out of this drawdown." So I backed off on the trading. And then it's, it goes back to like the Jimmy Rogers thing about the money in the corner. All of a sudden, I started seeing trades that just were just too good not, not to take. So I would take them. 
and they started they became profitable now the old me would have micromanaged myself out of it but because i was so busy i would go a day or so and say oh wow it went up three or four points i would have easily grabbed that profit and put it in my pocket and been happy but then it made me realize just follow your plan stop the micromanagement stop trying to make everything happen in one day on these trades let them unfold and that made me realize that hey you know what I actually do better by letting things unfold and, and and probably five years before that I had even better less that I was on vacation um, and I was on a boat we had a sad phone but it wasn't really that good that was way back in the day and so I really wasn't able to micromanage my trades and when I got back to the airport I got I grabbed an IBD and I saw that I had absolutely printed money. I had some options positions on, and I absolutely printed money while I was off uh, sailing boats in the West Indies. And then, uh, of course, as soon as I got back to my house, uh, I, I, I exited all the trades and felt like a genius because I just paid for my vacation. I was feeling pretty good. And then I watched in agony as they just went on and on and on. So uh, keep yourself busy if you if you get lonely uh, and uh, – it just do that, uh, and that's going to help out uh, tremendously. But that is an interesting thing to um, to mention. Why does a trading system guarantee being profitable? Sometimes I feel trading randomly would have done better. Sometimes trading randomly will have done better, okay? Uh, a trading system is statistical, and you can have uh, good streaks and bad streaks, obviously. At, the way you convince yourself that you have a viable trading system is you spend a heck of a lot of time looking at it. And like we discussed, I think it was last week, we were doing the the uh, allegory about the elephant. You have to live through a bull market. You have to live through a bear market. You have to live through a choppy market. You have to live through those periods where you feel like God. You have to live through those periods where you feel like an idiot. And through that experience, you learn. It's kind of like the I often say over and over again about the uh, Douglas that I had on a cassette tape somewhere around here from from one of those tag conferences. Uh, Mark Douglas said a good salesman, well, bad salesman, will make a few sales calls, get bummed out, and go out and drink his lunch. Whereas a good salesman will make a few sales calls and, and get bummed, and not he won't get bummed out. He'll get a few no's. But then I'll go get a big cup of coffee and says, you know what? I'm getting closer and closer to some to nailing some sales. It's a numbers game. So once you get your head wrapped around a methodology, you know it's a numbers game, but you just sometimes have to bide your time. And that's, you know, getting back to what the question about loneliness is. If you're sitting there kind of lonely, you're going to look for some action and do the wrong thing. So make sure you keep on yourself um, really busy. OK, but yeah, Shay, you have to convince yourself that something works before you rush out and try it, okay? Now, uh, getting to the, um, getting back to the, the take of the partial profits, uh, last week we talked about the better than the poke the eye trade. So this is just a real example, one that stopped out last week. It also was a discretionary example because the stop was like right in here and it just kind of barely went up above it and came right back yet by the end of the day. But I don't want to digress too far on that, but this is what your better than the poke the eye is gonna look like. You're gonna make a thousand bucks, or 1%, so whatever your account size is, you'll make 1% and you'll scratch out a remainder. Well, it's better than a poke at AI. At least you made something on the trade. Okay, you got in the trade. Actually, you got in it here. And it went down the right here, okay? And you were able to take some profits out and then eh, it came back up, stopped out. So what? Okay, so what? Would you rather have $1,000 or no dollars? Okay. Yeah, but Dave, you could have 2000 Yeah. You know, nobody's that right. If you start if you start taking profits every time here, then you're gonna definitely miss out on on this move. That's one of the things that I can guarantee. And on the upside, it's even more important because you definitely could have infinity on the upside. On the downside, obviously, as we discussed last week, um, there is a limit to how much you can make on the downside, but you could certainly trade around positions on their way down. Don says, go and buy a Ford if you're bored. Don loves his Fords. Okay. Any questions on the psychological aspects of the money position management 
or any questions on the statistical aspects of it. It was kind of cool. I was on a project a while back, an institutional project, and um, the guy that was keeping the stats, who's a who's a, an accomplished trader in and of himself, was like, that's pretty neat the way Dave's been doing this, and that's really helped him to uh, to do exceptionally well on the project. And he's like, I never thought of it that way. So that's this, as simple as my stuff is. A lot of times I, I forget that not everybody knows that. And uh, so anyway, now we have a dead uh, – What? hello, Dave. Uh, what are you risk going into an open position, opening a position? 2%. You risk 2% of the account, and I'll show you in the next slide. So uh, this this week we have a dead money report. We hadn't had one in a little while, and I thought this would be a good one uh, to show you. And I took this straight from my column. So the plan was, number one, to enter at a certain point. Number two, to place a protective stop at a certain point. Number three, to take partial profits at a certain point. And then four, and allow the stop to slowly widen with the hopes of it turning to a longer term trade. Yeah, good questions coming in. And we'll get to those. So this is a screen grab up here from the trading service on 9-19. I think it actually triggered a few days later. And the idea was to get in at 25, put in a stop at 22, and take profits, additional profits, at 28. So that's three points risk. And again, this is just a screen grab from the uh, service. So here's your entry point, and here's your stop. Now, notice that we didn't get that initial gratification like I was talking about earlier in my textbook example one two three days max or two days max or sometimes the first day you get your profits in this particular case it didn't do a whole lot so that could have been your short-term dead money report i'd be willing to bet if you go back and watch the week of charts from that week or right around here i probably did a little dead money report on that so you take partial profits when you're blessed with that nice little profits and then you try your stop higher well look what happened this position just died okay the stock just died it started going sideways so what do you do nothing what's your plan okay this is your plan and you want to follow that plan now i could say this every week until i'm blue in the face and admittedly i know it's easier said than done it's hard to sit through days and weeks and even months while the position is going sideways but as long as you're not stopped out there's nothing wrong with the stock now you want to obsess before you get into the trade and not afterwards this was an ipo if memory serves and notice that it accelerated higher and we had a little bit of a knockout move i mean this was beautiful you could almost draw a line through almost every bar back here mathematically that's equivalent of linear regression that's just absolutely beautiful and then you got your nice little pullback here. Plus, it's an IPO, if memory serves. So there's some excitement about the future in this stock. Okay. So, again, you have to obsess here while everything is 100% clear. Ah, I like that. Obsess here while everything is 100% clear. And then you enter into the unknown. Well, how do you deal with the unknown? Follow your plan. Okay. There's your plan right there. Does it always work? No, of course not. If it did, you wouldn't see my fat ass again. <laughs> yeah, you would. I'd come out, I'd, I'd come out and taunt you. Um, anyway, so you take partial profits, and you got your stop up to break even. So worst case, you scratch out, and at least you made something. And best case, who knows? This thing might keep on going. Okay, it took a while. This is probably the longest, most... Um, um, exaggerated example of dead money I've ever seen, but the stock really didn't do it, it, it really didn't do anything that wrong. In fact, it actually it's a little hard to see in here, but if you look at the volatility of this stock, it really dropped off. So this range is not quite as exaggerated as it, it might appear on the chart because it's only like a couple of points in here. So it, the volatility really decreased, and then now we're getting that reversion to the mean move back in volatility. So it's not dead yet. By the way, dead money, um, Investopedia has a good uh, article on it or a little one-page blurb on it. 
But I think if memory serves, it says uh, money that has no hopes of ever turning a profit or paraphrasing. That's pretty close. Well, if you knew that, then by all means, get out of your positions. But you don't know that. As I said time and time before, I know I'm going to bore some of you here by saying it's too late, right? But I've showed uh, stocks that we've entered, and, and a month later, after going completely sideways, they got taken over, okay? Which, to me, you'd say, oh, Dave, you excited I got taken over? Made, you made 100%? No, I, I, I could have made two or 300% had they not been taken over, and the stock just continued to go higher. Evidently, there's a reason they were taken over, because they felt like they had the potential to make a lot more earnings, and so they're willing to pay twice the price overnight anyway so you can see this position so far and this is based on yesterday's close which is somewhere in here that on the second low so far this is your profits on that trade now you've been into it for a while and you're it's you're up about 35 percent which is better than poke in the eye but you can see based on the fact that it wasn't a hugely volatile stock you still have quite a few shares on so you have Round numbers, you have 300 shares, 600 total. You started with 600, and then you sold 300. So now you have 300 left. On a um, 100K account, this is based on a hypothetical 100K account. We've got to keep it hypothetical for uh, educational purposes only because I am not an RIA. So based on that, and I'll make a little air quotes, hypothetical 100K account, that would be your gain. So that's almost, uh, that's about 3%. So now you're up 3% on that, and then you already made 1%. So, so far, so good on this trade, knock on wood. So, as I just said, this was the very simple plan. And it's always this simple, at least the plan is, okay? Following it, again, is not. And admittedly, occasionally, we do apply a little discretion, like I talked about last week in the UAL, okay? So... We enter at a certain point, we place a protective stop at a certain point, take partial profits at a certain point, and then allow the stop to widen out. When you went in with 25 and set the stop at 22, that's more than 10% risk. Yes, absolutely. Some of my best positions are, I might have a 20% stop on them, okay? What was the NVRO stop? Uh, it was like eight points or something, okay? It was it a was much wider stop. But you're compensating by trading fewer and fewer shares. Uh, I have an article that will be out any day on volatility. Once it's out, I'll, I'll put a link uh, under free reports on my website so you guys can go grab that. And in the article, I said it's better the devil you know. You're better off trading a more volatile stock than a less volatile stock because the more volatile stock has a better chance of moving. Yes, you're going to have to use a wider stop. But so what? A lot of people are like, oh, I can't, I can't use a 20% stop. Well, use a 5% stop, and I can guarantee you you're going to get stopped out on that trade. And you're going to get stopped out on every trade where the short-term volatility is more than 5%. The 2% risk is 2% on your entire account, which comes to $2,000. So even though this risk in here is 10% or whatever uh, – about 12%, I guess, maybe a little bit more than 10%. So even if your risk is 10, let's just use 10% round numbers. So let's say this is 10%. If it comes down and stops you out, you're going to lose 2% of your account, okay? So let's say this risk was 20%. You're going to trade only half as many shares. So you only trade about 300 shares total on a 100K account. So if it stops out, then you're going to lose how much on your account? You're going to lose 2%. OK, so no matter what your stop is, you're going to lose two percent of your account value. Now, if you go in and watch some older YouTubes of mine and I actually took the spreadsheet and that became the genesis of the article, you'll see that trading a less volatile stock could actually be more dangerous, believe it or not, than trading a more volatile stock because you're going to have to put on more shares based on the lower volatility. I don't want to get too much into that. You can read the article. OK, so does that. Um, does that answer your question on that? I, or I, it was a statement, but that should answer the question. And, you know, like I've said before, there's a popular method out there that says you should use an 8% stop on every trade. Well, that's like saying we should all wear a medium-sized shirt, something that I haven't done since I was probably four years old, okay? 
What about NVRO is attracted to you to me? It doesn't look like it's a longer term trend. So because the question, what do you consider a long term trade? Well, this, you know, we'll we'll get to that NVRO when we get to the charts. Uh, but the question is, you know, let's let's use this. Is this a longer term trend? No, it's a sideways trend. OK, well, Dave, you're a trend follower. Why'd you get out? Well, because I wasn't stopped out. It did not go down and hit the stop. So I stayed with the position. Now, it's OK. And I've been telling my people in this stock for months. So what if that it's going sideways? I'd rather a stock go sideways for a while, digest its gains, go up. OK, and then go sideways again, digest its gains and just go up, rinse and repeat a la Darva style. OK, just keep making boxes on top of boxes. And then 10 years from now, we're up about a million percent in this stock. I'd much rather that happen than a stock shoot up 50, 60 percent, 70 percent over a few days. And then, bam, come right back in and stop me out. Well, it's better than poking the eye. It feels good for a few days, but I'd much rather catch a longer term trend. So there is no trend in here, okay, on a net net basis. You were here, and then months from now, let's go all the way, let's say right here. Okay, that's a perfect sideways trend with some zigs and zags in between. So what? You didn't get stopped out, okay? Well, Dave, why not just get out and get back in? Well, okay, where are you going to get back in? You know, now it's breaking out. A lot of times breakout fail, you know, so it breaks out, fails, you get out, and then all of a sudden, it gaps open, uh, it's up way up here, and then you can't get back in. It's too late. So it's tough sometimes. But what makes it easier? Follow the plan. Follow the plan. Okay, again, like I wrote in the last column. Number one, enter a certain point. Number two, place a stop in case you're wrong, which you will be sometimes, I promise. Take profits if it uh, begins to rally. And then allow that stock to widen out. Okay. All right. Any any question on <laughs> any questions on anything covered so far? Michael says fix or repair daily. That's a Ford or Fiat. Fix it again, Tony. <laughs> Michael, Don's gonna get mad at you. How do you statistically measure a discretionary method? You can't. You can't statistically measure any method. You cannot statistically measure any method. I don't care what anyone says. Because markets are not normally distributed, okay? If markets were normally distributed, we wouldn't have all the so-called Talib black swans, the so-called black swans coined by um, Talib. They simply aren't. If markets were normally distributed, and you could use statistics, then whoever knew the most about statistics or whoever and or whoever had the biggest computers would own the markets. So if you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. But yes, you could not, I cannot guarantee my edge in the markets but i know it works because i know sooner or later market would trend and the only way you could ever make money on a trade is to capture a trend you must sell higher than you buy and you must cover lower than you short okay so that's why i'm a trend follower let's say you're a contra trend player well you buy let's say you buy oversold markets well that's fine but the only way you're going to make money is if that position moves in your favor. So that position is going to have to trend. If it just drops further, then you can lose more and more money. And then the true reversion to the B players say, well, you should buy more, which is a recipe for disaster. It's not my way or highway, though. So whatever you want. Okay, we'll cover that. Everybody's asking a lot of questions about NVRO. So let's cover that, and then uh, I'll finish up the slides, and then we'll hop into the um, – We'll get back to the markets. Okay. So what did I say in NVRO to begin with? Okay. Well, it should be pretty obvious. This is just absolutely beautiful back here. Okay. But let's go ahead and zoom that in. Let's zoom in as far as we can. See if we can get way back there. Take a look at it.
NVRO was an IPO last year. It took off. Not only did it take off, let me clean this chart up. Not only did it take off, I mean, this should be plain as the nose in your face. You see, it kind of worked its way higher. Nothing not to get too excited about then, but then it began to accelerate higher. Anyone who owned this stock prior to it coming public, anyone who bought this stock after it came public, insiders, uh, flippers, uh, venture capitalists, whoever the players are, are happy because they're at a profit. This is your first correction, your first pullback in an accelerated uptrend, okay? So that's a beautiful setup. Now, the second question on this one is, Hey, Dave, it doesn't look like a trend. Well, you're right. It's no longer a trend, right? Well, it's it's a trend. It's just not a beautiful trend, okay? Uh, if you want, maybe throw a longer-term moving average in there. Maybe that'll make it look like a trend. I don't know how much a 200-day moving average will, will give us. Probably nothing. Let's put a 50-day in there. Let's see. Oh, let's fix this. Okay. Well, even the 50 is flattened out, okay? But you can see it's still, from here to here, at least it's higher than it was, okay? But what you do is you just follow your plan, okay? We took some partial profits in here, and in fact, I think we actually we actually made a little bit more. Every now and then you get a little lucky. Yeah, see right here, 13.57 per 100K? So you actually you you actually made 1.3 percent on the trade when you're only looking for one percent. So you actually made more money on that than you intended, which is a good thing. Won't always happen, but it's a good thing. So why are you still in the trade? Well, the trade is the is not. I don't know where the stop. Where's the stop on this one? Let me look. Let me see. Stop is. Oh, I can't see it from the screen. Well. Anyway, you're not stopped out yet, so this thing is just consolidating. And then, yeah, it's going sideways, but who cares? Maybe it's going to pop up again and make another base on top of a base, just like that CTLT. Okay? If I had to bet on one, I, I mean, I don't know. Well, that's, I hate to say that because then I get myself in trouble. But I really thought this one be a little more volatile was going to take off long before the CTLT did. Okay? So, uh Daphne, did that answer your question on the um, why did we get into the first place? What about NVR was tracked to you? Yeah, to me it doesn't look like a longer-term trend, so it begs the question. Yeah, now keep in mind that, again, as I preach over and over and over again, it even said today, you obsess when you have perfect hindsight, and then you just accept. Okay, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. And I think I said this in my last article on my website. Obsessed and then Except, okay. All right. Um, I had, or I discovered, I, I, I should say, at the last hour, I discovered I had a, a link error in my um, link to the stock selection course at the last minute. I'm going to put the new graphic in. The link uh, came out, and it's just the way it defaults when you replace a graphic. And I didn't notice that until like the last minute. So I extended the sale until until Monday the 3rd, okay? So uh, $500 off the course until Monday the 3rd. With my courses come a, two, a couple things. One, you have unlimited, within reason, access to me with the caveat that the questions have to be related to the course. You can't say, hey, Dave, I want your stock selection course. I, I want to develop a trading methodology. Uh, this is my thoughts. Uh, will you help me develop the methodology? The answer is no, unless you're going to pay me, okay, and pay me a lot of money because I don't want to get into – if I'm going to develop methodologies for someone, I'm going to go work for an institution and do that where I'll make a lot more money. But what I will do is I will answer any question that relates to the course, and I will help you. Now, keep in mind that I don't want to be the guy who just gives you fish. I want to teach you how to fish. What's the old saying? Teach a man how to fish. He'll sit in a boat and drink beer all day. Um, <laughs> but no, I want to teach you how to fish so that you could, in case I get hit by a beer truck or something, so you could take this knowledge 
and and profit from it. Uh, just like with the IPO course, if you want to, if you have a question, if you get the IPO course, you have a question on any IPO from now until um, until I leave this planet, <laughs> I'll be happy to field that question. I'll keep in mind that I'm going to make you work. I might make you go back in. I'll answer the question, but I might make you go in and watch a course. The second thing that all courses come with is free access to follow-up courses. I like to to go back in, freshen the material up a little bit, see what works, see what didn't, see how conditions change. So I'm probably going to start redoing the courses about once every year. I'm due to do the IPO course, and uh, tentatively I have that scheduled to uh, be redone um, in August, and I'm going to redo that course. And then uh, the stock selection course, I haven't set a date yet for it, but I will redo that course at some point in time. So you get free access to any new updates to the course, and you come to the new live courses with that. So anyway, I don't want to pontificate too much on this, but if you're interested in this, you can go to my store, or you can use this direct link here, okay? And live courses are going to be, uh, any live courses uh, are, are, are never discounted, okay? Um, so if you get, if you want to get in at this lower rate here, then you'll have access to the live course. Same thing goes for the IPO course. If you get any IPO course now, when I redo it in August, you'll have access then. What is your cost schedule posted, Dave? Uh, go to my web, go to, go to the store. Everything's there. Okay. And by the way, I did take down the uh, trial rate on the service, but uh, I will, I will be putting that back up. It won't be as low as it was, but I will be putting back up a, a trial rate for first time people only. Uh, I've got 10 years of archives out there. I think you can go in and look at uh, a few months, a few years, and, and, and just determine whether or not the service is for you or not. You can watch these week at charts. Every week I use examples that are straight from the service, and quite often I publish the web, uh, the, uh, the actual spreadsheet. So you can see how it works, good, bad, and a different leaf. Um, and so I, I don't really see the need for a, a low, a low uh, uh, trial anymore at least at this particular time, check back off and I might uh, change my mind. All right, I'm ready to chop, jump into the charts. So let's jump into the charts. Okay, I tried downloading reports, but the links in the email were wrong. All right, I'll check that out. Let me make a, uh, let me make a note of that. Yeah, I'm having a little, a few growing pains here and there, but it's all good. Um, it's a complex system that I implemented, and um, it could do a lot of things. But yeah, it does have um, some pitfalls as far as um, getting some of this stuff up and running. All right, uh, yeah, feel free to start asking about questions. Good questions. Keep uh, uh, stocks. I'm sorry. Let me cover the overall market real quick. Let's take a look at a few of these sectors, and then we'll uh, we'll hop into those individual stocks. Okay, overall market, basis of the P's. Let me clean this chart up a little bit. I like to look at the micro and then uh, back the chart out a little bit and look at the macro. So let's uh, put a 200-day moving average in there. The S&P 500 on a micro basis just came straight up, flying straight up off its 200-day moving average, Okay. And if you back the chart out, as I said earlier, the last November, you can see it hasn't made a whole lot of progress. But it could just be consolidating its gains before it makes a new leg higher. Um, in a market, when prices prices are perceived as either being too high, too low, or just about right. And when prices come too high, become too high, they correct, as you know. Now, too high is arbitrary, but when they become too high, they begin to correct until they find a level. And if they can base at that level for a while, everyone becomes accustomed to those prices. Remember how Dow 10,000 was this big deal, you know? But then once Dow gets to 10,000 and stays at 10,000 for a long time, everybody gets used to Dow being 10,000, okay? So it's kind of like the S&P 500 up here around 2,100. People will become 
accustomed to that level. And this is why or how technical analysis works. You're just simply reading the mind of the market, okay? Let me see if I can get a blank screen in here. Uh, I guess black won't work. I know I do that again. Here we go. So, so let's say a market rallies up and it just seems like it's too high up here, okay? Well, then it consolidates by going sideways. So let's just let's just use uh, let's call this 2,000, which would be close to where the P's have been. So 2,000 seems a lot of, uh, pretty high, especially when you're back here at, at 1,000, not that long ago, or what 666 back in uh, 2009, right? But the longer you stay at 2,000, the more that gets perceived as a value zone, okay, or where it should be valued and the bottom of that range i guess would be a value zone the top of the range would be high on a more micro basis okay but in general as long as the prices stay around this range that's about where they should be because everybody becomes accustomed and adjusts to those adjusts to those prices traders are in agreement on price around this 2000 level well if it breaks out but then it comes back in, what happens? This becomes support because people say, oh, okay, the breakout didn't work, but this would be a good place to buy this market because it's the value zone. Unfortunately, and conversely, if it breaks out the bottom of the range, this is going to become what's called overhead supply because if the stock or the market, I should say, tries to rally back up, this is, they're going to have a lot of people that had bought in this range that would be looking to get out at break even, okay? Everything I do from a technical analysis standpoint has some sort of psychological backing to it. I'm not going to go out there and count a wave or, I mean, you know, it's not my way or highway. If that's something you like to do, then go out and do it. But I want to show that, or I got to wrap my head around it, I should say. So if I tell you something, it's based on the fact that, okay, this market's accelerating higher, like that IPO we just talked about, the VC, the venture capitalists, the people with the sweat equity, the CEOs, uh, and people at high levels of the company with a lot of stock, they're all happy. They're all making money because that stock is at all-time highs from where it came public. The flippers are, are, are the privilege, and I'm putting quotes in the air, few, not enough time to get into that today, but, but trust me, if you can get an IPO pre-market, uh, don't because longer term, a lot of them will fail. But that's a story for another conversation. But everyone is happy. So psychologically, there is some basis to that. Now, let's get back to the markets where I digress too far. So this area here, this longer term sideways trend is going to be perceived as a value zone or where the market should be. And if we break out of the top of it, this is going to become support. Unfortunately, if we break down out of the bottom of it, as I just explained, that will become resistance. Now, with the market going as sideways as it is, you want to be very, very selective in your stock picking, okay? And we've been able to survive this sideways market, knock on wood, through, through doing two things. Through, number one, very good stock picking, if I say so myself, and number two, which is just as important, sitting on your hands when there's nothing to do. I went weeks in my service without recommending any new stocks. And then uh, a couple of ones that I did after a couple of weeks of not doing anything, a lot of those did trigger. Okay. So technically we went a long time without new setups and that's okay. Okay. So P's bounced off of their 200 day moving average. And the good news is, and I think this is the high right here. We're only a percent of change away from all-time highs. So round number is about a percent. So one or two big up days, we'd be at all-time highs in the P's, and that would be a great thing. By the way, notice that the 200-day moving average also corresponds with the bottom of its recent range in here. A lot of times, as I preach, technical analysis 
technical uh, indicators will come together at the same point. One more point too, by the way, and I did an article for Proactive Magazine. I do a little one-page blurb for them every now and then when I get into rotation uh, on um, just simple ways to just what I see in the markets and things. And uh, the one I did a while back was on uh, daylight. And notice that daylight being the lows are greater than the, than the um, than the moving average. For the most part, you had a lot of daylight in this S&P 500. We came down and just kind of touched it, and now we have daylight again meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. If you could draw a trend line between the lows and the moving average, then that is daylight, okay? All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Uh, on a micro level, yesterday we had a bit of a, what appeared to be a brick and mortar rally, okay? In fact, there's brick and mortar in and of itself right there. Uh, materials of construction, okay? Great um, example of brick and mortar. Brick and mortar means uh, it's an old term for those of you who don't know it or for those of you who are not from the States. It's just a term that means like a, something tangible as a stock. It's, there's a building with brick and mortar as opposed to like an Internet company, which is a little bit more intangible. OK, so yesterday was a bit of a brick and mortar rally, so to speak, in the uh, NASDAQ. And you can see it ran up a little bit in here, not quite as much as the P's. The good news is the NASDAQ with today's data in here so far, we're a little bit less than 2% away from all time highs. So, so far so good in the NASDAQ and so far, we didn't even get anywhere near, at least not in this last little correction, the 200 day moving average. And again, there's your trend line below the 200 day moving average. Nothing magical about it, but notice that uh, the slope and the daylight can help you keep you on the right side of the market. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty scores is a tiny bit of a bummer, but the Rusty could uh, get its act together and take off again. It could happen. One thing that had me concerned uh, a while back in the Rusty was it had a thrust down. It had a retrace up, and it kind of stalled short of its old highs. So anyone who bought down here thinking it was going to new highs is going to be like, oh, no, it's not. Here we go again. They're willing to bail out. Um, anyone who bought way up here that didn't make it back to new highs, they're like, oh, well, I better just give up. Okay. And then you might have a few shorts or these these uh, retracement players in here. It's almost – it's kind of a first thrust. So even even a few swing traders might step up. And the reason we didn't – I didn't put it on the list was because we had all the support down here. So what's the most you're going to get out of the trade from there to there? Well, it's, it worked out nicely, okay, what, in hindsight, better than the poke in the eye. But I don't think it's worth it whenever you have a trade that is capped, and that's why I didn't put it on my trading service. Plus, it's an efficient market, and it's harder to trade efficient markets as opposed to something like an inefficient market like the NVRO and the CTLT that we talked about a little while ago. So – Russell's got a ways it goes to make it to go to make it back to old highs or new highs, however you want to look at that. But it is kind of consolidating in here, and it did find a little support. And admittedly, it's not much you get excited about there, but it's kind of hanging in there. Uh, some of these sectors are doing okay uh, today, notwithstanding. But insurance is like right shy of new highs in here. A couple other areas, retail's been doing really well. You can see retail closed at brand new highs just yesterday. Let me unflag everything so we don't forget what I talked about. And drugs have been doing pretty good, but then they kind of stalled out a little bit on a kind of a micro basis in here and a little rally back up. But I wouldn't count them down and out just yet. Biotech, kind of same thing. Biotech, a little bit of a bummer because it pulled back and kind of stalled out a little bit. Longer term uptrend still intact. Now, when you see this kind of action in here, and some might argue that, well, it could look, looks like a micro head and shoulders. It might be. But when you see this kind of action in here, you want to do two things. You want to honor your stops just in case. And then number two, you want to be selective on, on any new positions. We have one uh, biotechnology-related stock that we're looking at, and we've got a couple on our radar. But we're going to make darn sure that we wait for entries on these particular on these potential positions, I should say. Uh, health services was just at new highs or just, just shy of new highs just yesterday, kind of eh, losing a little steam today, but right there, okay? So you've got a few areas that are kind of hanging in there. Now, like I said in the call, last column, depends on where you want to look. If you want to bear, make a bear case, chemicals have imploded, and they pull back a bit, little bit. They kind of look poised to make a new leg lower. Energies look absolutely abysmal. And by the way, this is why you don't try to catch a falling knife, okay? Down at their old lows, they look pretty cheap, right? 
Again, I'm making kind of air quotes in the air. But notice that they took out those lows with vigor. So you don't want to try to catch a falling knife. Now, I'm not going to go out and trade them, but they do look a little sold out way down here. Okay. But that doesn't mean you should rush out and trade them. Because, I mean, look at what the metals did. Metals looked a little sold out right here. After all, in a serious downtrend, they broke down. And then what happens? They make another leg lower. So you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend, and you don't want to fight the trend. I know it's cliche, but you'd be surprised how many people want to come in here and try to catch the bottom in the metals or the energies, especially something like gold. Look at gold. Gold looked cheap down here, okay, and then it got cheaper. What's the old saying? It's always darkest right before dawn. Well, I'd like to also say it's always darkest right before it gets more dark, okay? And this is why we don't try to catch the falling knife. Same thing for silver, as you can see, broken down in here. Uh, transports are getting a little iffy or been a little iffy, and now they're getting a little mixed. But you can see that they had a thrust lower. We had a thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, and then, you know, the question mark out here. Is this going to be a new leg lower here or what? But so far, looking kind of ugly. And again, that's the beauty of something simple like the 200-day moving average. You had a really, really nice trend all the way throughout here. And now we've got a lot of trading below the 200-day moving average. So maybe this is the beginning of a new trend lower. Okay. All right. Uh, I think I've covered pretty much everything. A couple other areas. I mean, it, again, it depends on where you look. You look at the foods. They're kind of hanging around. New highs in here. A lot of these other areas look a little dubious. Semiconductors, back of the dubious column. And, you know, a lot of people like to see the transports rally with the overall market. I would like to see that happen, too. That's the Dow theorist way of looking at things. But I don't worry about the transports as much as I worry about the semis. I, I like the semis to go in the same direction as the overall market. And as you can see right now, not looking too good. Um, I want to, was that a bow tie I drew in here? Yeah, you had kind of a, was it like a two-day bow tie or something? Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. That's a two-day chart. Beautiful bow tie. And then so far, it's selling off fairly hard out of that bow tie. So semis looking a little questionable in here. So again, it all depends on where you look on what you're seeing. Uh, on a good note here, now this, I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds. I like to see it like off like a multi-multi-year low. I mean, I know it's more than one year. So it's, it's technically a buy signal in bonds. But I would like to see this come off a major, major, major low. But you've got a bow tie in bonds. Now, bonds have been headed lower. And everybody in their brothers is like the sky is falling. Interest rates are going up. And they have been going up. Okay, bonds down, rates up, as you know. But now we've got a bow tie higher in bonds. And now bonds are beginning to bottom out a little bit and looking pretty darn constructive. So this might help the market along a little bit. So, again, it, it comes down to, once again, it all depends on where you look for what you see in the overall market. And that's why you got to be really careful not to have a strong bias. Now, we all have a bias if we're mostly long, or we all have a bias if we're mostly short. Right now, all we have, I think, is three longs or four longs left over in the portfolio. So you got to resist the temptation to only see the, the positive bias, to see the glass is half full and half full only. OK, so it's, it gets back to the elephant, the trunk, the tree, the spear, the fan or whatever else, the wall. OK, you got to see the whole elephant and you get it right now. I'm seeing it's a very mixed bag. The good news is if these indices could break out to new highs, we're one to two percent, depending on what indice you're looking at, index you're looking at. If we do break out to new highs, that rising tide will eventually begin to lift all of these boats. So there's nothing wrong with putting on a short or two right now. If you see a really good looking setup, we'll probably see some in the semis real soon. Uh, we might take them, okay? Not my favorite thing to do, shorting that is, but if we see a chance, we're going to take it, the Steve Winwood trade, and we'll put some shorts on. Uh, but as a general statement, you want to continue to err on the, longer, on the side of the longer-term trend in the overall market. But, yes, if you do see some shorts setting up that are worth taking, eh, I think it's worth a shot. OK, is that your bow tie? Yeah, the bow tie here is uh, I like to put the 50 day simple in with the bow tie. And if you get a fulcrum like we have here right at the 50, and let me just clean up this chart so it doesn't get too busy on you. But when you get that fulcrum, notice they all cross beautifully right around that 50 and notice the inflection point of the angle on the 50. That's a pretty good signal 
Um, in an ideal world, though, I prefer if that signal was coming off of like right here, much longer term lows and, and much lower levels as opposed to these mid levels in here and only a year and change. For instance, if you look back like at the uh, bow tie back here, although it kind of imploded a little bit, so far that top remains in place and that was from all time highs, okay? So yes, Jeff, that's the bow tie. All right, let's uh, open it up for individual stock questions. Some good questions coming in already. And uh, we'll start um, looking at those. Okay, I like ETSY. Uh, yeah, that's actually been in my lander list for a while. I think I took it off yesterday. Uh, but it still looks pretty good, admittedly. Uh, this was the mother of all failed IPOs. And this is an example I've shown over and over again. And this is why you don't buy an IPO when it comes out. But sometimes you let them bottom out and you get a little bit of a bow tie or something like this once the moving averages begin to work. Uh, then they could they could be a viable setup, but yeah, it looks um it looks pretty good. I can't argue with you on that. Congrats on Ruby. Well, Ruby stopped out a while back, but Ruby was a Ruby was one of those longer term positions too, and it went sideways for a while, and then it came back in and stopped out. So what? It's better than the poke in the eye trade. So, but yeah, we're no longer in Ruby, so I can't. Uh, get excited about that. Thoughts on Apple? Is, go is it going lower? Well, let's take a look at it. I'm not a big fan of Apple because it's such a big, thick stock. Um, unfortunately, it does look like it could be in trouble. Uh, everything I just said, remember about the value zone and all, uh, this uh, level here, and what's the bottom of that range? Oh, about one, let's just say 125 round numbers, 130. Uh, that's going to be hard for Apple to get through that level. I wouldn't rush out and short it, but uh, I do have a strategy I call reversal gap strategy to those of you who know it. Uh, this is a little bit of an extreme example, but yeah, you got a gap down after almost making new highs. And so technically it would be a short, but it's super duper thick stock and it's become very efficient. So I would, uh, I would pass on Apple, but it, yes, I agree. It does look like it is a little bit of trouble at this uh, moment. Hey Jerry, uh, that's, that's service that, um, Stock is on the trading service, so we can't. Uh, but good eye, good eye. Jerry was on my service for a while. Looks like he um, he got the gist of how it works. Uh, Simp is making a knockout move or lower or just plain dangerous. Oh, all right. Uh, yes, to answer your question. <laughs> well, the problem with Simp is that when you get a trend knockout, you want to see a market go like this, and you want to see it do this. Okay. So this is kind of an extreme example right here, but this would have been a trend knockout because notice you've got this nice accelerated trend higher, okay? But now it's not really a trend knockout because you just got this little breakout in here. You broke out, and now you've come all the way back. It looks okay. If it takes out, let's just say, 45 round numbers, then it would be okay. Uh, I would pass on it as an actual setup, though, but I hear you. Um but remember, the trend knockout, you want to have a pretty serious trend that you want to knock out from. You don't want a little breakout that comes all the way back into its prior base. And this was this is something that was covered. I think I covered this in the stock selection course, and I might even cover it in, in the um, the teaser video I did on YouTube. So check that out if you get a chance. A-N-T-H for Jerry. Okay. Um. This one has caught my eye quite a bit. I just can't get past the longer term problems with this chart. Markets have really long memories, and sometimes uh, you could run into a little trouble. Uh, remember, we talked about this one as a pullback a few weeks back, I think, if memory serves. Um, I think I'd pass, and, and even if it didn't have those problems way back then, you don't. You want to see it kind of clear this prior peak more decisively before uh, looking to trade those pullbacks. Okay, I don't know if I, I can't copy links, unfortunately, I don't think. Uh, something with Bitcoins. Cryptocurrency seems like a good buy. Um, yeah, I can't I can't bring the link up on that, but uh, that's something we could certainly explore. I'll take a look at it. Uh, I do have a, um, I do have a way to plot Bitcoins, but not not quickly. Uh, Daphne, yeah, your answer your question, yes, we can't talk about that one. That's actually the setup of today. Very good eyes. I'm proud of you. Good job. My work is done. Um, yeah, I'll take a look at that one, uh, Andre, later. I'll take a look at Bitcoin. Sorry about it. I can't, I can't plat it. Yeah, in a smiley face. What? 
Jeff wants to know at what Jeff Johnson Johnson. I think I know a Johnson or two. Um, went to college with one or two. Of course, I went to college in uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana, undergraduate school. So I know a few of those. Uh, no, no, because you just you're just kind of scraping bottom here, okay. And then also, it's kind of an electrocardiogram. It runs up, it comes down, it runs up, it comes down. It's kind of a Jackie Mason slash electrocardiogram kind of stock. Uh, it would have to bottom out and then rally off that low. Maybe make a bow tie or something before I get too excited. Susie says, I went long PayPal today. Wants to know what I think, okay? All right, let's take a look at that. PayPal was a setup for a few days in the service. Uh, on my ancillary setups. The only thing I don't like about it is I wish it would have made a bigger leg higher. It's also a big, thick stock, as you know. But no, it's not bad. That's what I call the first deep retracement. So uh, congratulations. I think that's a I think that's a good trade. I'm not going to argue with you on that one. Dave, is there a price point you won't short because it isn't much room to go down. Well, technically, uh, it percentage-wise, it could. But, uh, yeah, as a general statement, I, I prefer higher price stocks when it goes to short. And like the UAL example I used, I actually, as a general statement, prefer, prefer just the opposite on the short side than I do the long side. And if you get that, download the report. Hopefully, the links are okay on the website. But let me know if they're not, uh, if anyone else is having trouble. But if you download the Go Go No Mo report under free reports, which is under the store, there's one that I did on uh, shorting efficient stock. And go go, I mean like a go go stock. Nomo means like the momentum is lost. So if you short these efficient stocks, you could do uh, quite well. So yeah, ideally you want to see them a little higher priced. I don't have a number in my head. It's kind of like uh, Justice Powder Stewart. I know I want to see it. But if you need me to throw a number out to you, uh, Dath, and I'd say uh, about $20 a share at least, you want to see something that's actually a little bit higher level before you start shorting. Okay, so we need to check out Bitcoin when we get offline, and then we'll take a look at that. Anyone trade Bitcoins? I've got a, um, I have an account with, a, I can't decide whether it's legitimate or not. And it's something I don't want to explore, but I can't decide whether it's legit. Anybody ever trade them? And again, I'd, I'd much prefer, although I will trade Forex uh, too, but I'd much prefer trading something that's a little bit more inefficient. Speaking of inefficient, somebody just pulled up, uh, wants to know about, who wants to know about Fold? Uh, Don, hey Don, good good stock. Uh, yeah, it looks good. It broke out and you got a little pullback and it's above the base. Okay, so yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, if you're long, stay long. But yeah, it does look uh, really good. Thoughts on Apple? Yeah, we looked at Apple. Don wants to know. See, Don's going to undeem himself. Can you undeem yourself after you redeem yourself? What's a good word for that? Uh, Ford, eh, you know, it's still in a downtrend. It's pulled back. But it's efficient. Uh, trades a bazillion shares every day. Uh, from here all the way to here is only two points. I know, percentage-wise, it's still a pretty big move. But not enough for me to get excited about. Uh, this is just too choppy, and it's not set up. You know, well, Dave, what about the Gogo Nomo? Yeah, well, if it's at high levels, begins at super high levels, begins to roll over, then it might be worth a shot because these stocks can be priced for perfection. Andre says dries is cheap too. Well, yeah, it's cheap, but you don't want to. Uh, now, this looks, this does look, uh, this does look sold out. Now, somebody years ago, I read it, this was a, a, it's kind of a long story, but you can get these stocks that do that kind of like do this and then they just kind of meander lower and lower and lower. And sometimes you get the mother of all bottoms, but I would never buy a stock at this juncture here. Let it scrape bottom and let it begin to rally and maybe take a bow tie off of that. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's cheap, but it could always get cheaper. Okay. MX. No, no, you got a big gap down in here. You don't want to, you know, anybody who, who got caught in this gap, they're looking to get out of break even. So there's no need to uh, to do that. Otex, uh, gap reversal strategy. Let's take a look at that. 
Otex. Um, yeah, technically, sort of, but you, you, you're coming back into another gap here, and then you also have all this overhead resistance. I know it's a ways away, and that'd be a good problem to have, but it just, to me, it's all over the place. It's kind of electrocardiogram, but technically, that could be a reversal gap strategy if it pulls back a little bit in here, would be a buy, but then... You've got so much overhead supply. Uh, I'd leave it alone. It's just all over the place. There's there's better stuff out there. I mean, we've already looked at quite a few stocks here today that are looking pretty good. Okay, Jerry wants to know about AMBA. Uh, no, because it's just made a double top in here. Uh, it was kind of like a TKO here. It did have a little bit of a gap. But now it's just kind of making a double top. So for me to get excited about this stock, it would have to set up again by breaking out the new highs. I think this was one that came up in the IPO course uh, way back here, if memory serves. If not, it looks just like one. EFOI. EFOI. I don't know who asked about that because I deleted them by accident. Uh, too thin. It only trades about 80,000 shares a day. Uh, IPO, sometimes I'll make an exception on thinness, but this one's kind of electrocardiogram. I hear you and I see what you're seeing, uh, but let's pick it apart. Uh, let's suppose, notice that you've got all this consolidation in here that came back down. Margin call. So I would uh, I would avoid this uh, particular trade. How many times I have to tell you I do a show every Thursday. Also, let's say you were trading to pull back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You've got nine days of the pullback. You kind of want to pull back to look like this, okay? You don't want to look like this, at least on, on, a, on a bigger level, okay? Now, this could end up, if it looks like this, this is going to confuse you a little bit, but if it does look like this, you could end up with what I call a double top knockout. But in this particular case, uh, I would pass just on the way it's acted in here. Plus, it's too thin, plus longer term, okay? I'm just trying to pick it apart in different ways, too. Gold further to go? I don't know, Carol. Uh, what do you think? It could, could. Uh, you know, it's in a downtrend for sure. Um, I think it's probably, you know, here's the thing you have to realize. Uh, I guess gold has in-use value. If something has in-use value, then you could argue that it's cheap. Stocks have no in-use value, okay? And this is a, an argument I'm borrowing from Tom McClellan. So if somebody's a commodity trader and and they just buy these markets when they hit 10-year lows or whatever they are, and they have deep pockets and they can hold on to them, it's not my style of trading. I'm not necessarily excited about trading in that kind of fashion. But they do have some end-use value. Uh, you can eat corn or you can grind it up and, and, and burn it. Uh, it helps to ruin engines by making it, you can make corn and ethanol, so to ruin engines, um, you know, but let's not go, let's not go there. But, um, yeah, I've blown through a couple of carburetors with uh, ethanol, but that's, that's another story. Anyway, it's got some end use value. Gold, I guess gold has some end use value to it. Um, that's it, a little bit more. And silver, you could definitely argue, it has, has end, use, end use value because silver is, is getting used up. Gold's more of a hoarding thing. But if something does have end use value, at some point it is a value, okay? Toilet paper is a good example of something that has end use value. If, um, let's say you were able to buy, I don't know what a roll of toilet paper costs, but let's say somebody offered you a deal of like 100,000 rolls of very high quality toilet paper for like uh, 10 cents each, okay? Well, that has in-use value, no pun intended, okay? Uh, even if toilet paper, you know, drops down in price, that toilet paper will always be used some, worth something because it has in-use value. So as long as something has in-use value, there is a value zone. Now, where that value zone is, I don't know, but you could certainly hold it forever until that value comes back if you have deep pockets and you're not a trader, okay? That's fine. So at some point, gold will have some in-use value to it. And where that level is, I do not know. But you don't have to pick a low. You don't have to try to buy low. Again, forget about being right. Think about making money. So let gold bottom out. Wait for that bow tie and then be all over it. Okay. Would you buy a short squeeze? No. 
Now, if a short squeeze sets up as a pattern, then yeah. But how do you really know if it's a short squeeze? I mean, you know in that you get the sharp move higher in a market, but you don't know for sure if it's actually a short squeeze or just some people buying, okay? But when you do trade a bow tie or a first thrust or any of these other emerging trends or transitional patterns, okay, you are getting in early to where that short squeeze could be the catalyst to push the market higher, to squeeze out more shorts, to attract more longs, and so on and so forth, especially if you're trading off of multi-multi-year lows, okay, or all-time lows, or let's say 10-year lows at least, then, yeah, you can get some really nice moves, even in inefficient markets like the currencies, okay? Uh, Dathan, that's actually on my buy list for today, too. Uh, I'm not, it's not an actual recommendation, but it is on my list of something I saw, so I can't talk about that. But, yeah, it's definitely, I hope I'm saying your name right. It's definitely set up. Um, yeah, we covered Amber already. Yeah, we looked at Watt. Watt, did you say, did you, did you ask about a stock and walk away? Did you, did you like go make a sandwich or something? Yeah, we talked about this one. It's wide and loose and all over the place. Wait for a setup. <laughs> you know, we we talked about you while you're away, Jeff. Just kidding. Day thin, question mark. Okay. Uh, Dave, it's pretty much to it. Just want the bottoming bow ties. Yeah, wait for a bow tie on that, Jeff. CHRS. Now, this is kind of your TKO type of move. If you took out this part of the chart, looking backwards, you can make a nice argument for this stock. Okay, it's worked its way higher. It's accelerate higher, and then, bam, you got a nice little TKO move, a TKO within the pullback. Go back and watch. I did. I don't – I need to catalog these one day. Maybe somebody could help me do this. But I did a YouTube or a week of charts where we just talked about TKOs, and I thought it was a pretty good show if I say so myself. And the point I was trying to make in the show is sometimes you can have a TKO within a pullback, and this is what you have here. So this is pretty good looking here, except that uh, you back the chart out a little bit, and you can see that, well, you're just barely getting past this peak, and now you're coming back below it. Again, you know, the human nature thing, anybody who bought around these highs uh, might be thinking about bailing out as it drops below. So for me, this would have to break out further for me to get interested in it again, okay? All right, let's take a look at a few more, and we're almost done, JBLU. Um, I'm not a big fan of the airlines. It broke out, and then it came back in below its little breakout levels in here, so let it accelerate higher before going after it. I mean, it's not horrible, but, I mean, it is longer-term trend, but it's not set up. ERI for Andre, ERI. Uh, no, notice you broke out, and then you came right back in. You broke out and came right back in. OK, if you're long, stay long by all means. OK, but again, we look for perfection going into a trade and you just take what you get afterwards. Agent. No, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, you had your your knockout move here, which looked pretty cool. And then it didn't really materialize and knockout never really triggered. And then now you've got a bunch of sideways movement. So it would have to make new highs. You went long VA after bow tie. That's uh, what Virgin. Yeah, good job. Yeah, this wasn't the cleanest setup in the world. Um, as far as like, uh, you know, it was it was kind of a, a gradual little little kind of sideways movement. But yeah, you did have a stealthy bow tie. This was in the list, oh, a few days ago or about a week or so ago. But yeah, good job on that. Uh, one thing I didn't like, you do have a little overhead supply to deal with, but I cannot I cannot argue with your success with that uh, particular bow tie. So good job on that. Thanks, Dave. Great show. Learned a lot and a few good setups confirmed. All right, Dathan. Cool. We'll get on the trading service and we'll conf I'll confirm you setups every day. <laughs> Agent. No, we talked about that one. And it, look what the bow ties here. It's kind of rolling over. Okay. You're welcome, Heather. Okay. PGNX. I think this will probably be, uh, we'll take one more. Uh, no, notice you've got the little um, peak here. You got past the peak and came back in. Uh, again, you know, you want your, um, you don't want your your pullbacks to look like uh, look like this, and then you know back like that, pull back below, or however the case may be. Okay. Okay, looks like we're at the time limit here. Um, 
I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. Thank you guys so much for showing up. Any unanswered questions, I'll be happy to answer your emails, davidavelander.com. Just give me a little while because I'm, I'm pretty uh, slammed as of late, but uh, I will be happy to get to that. Anything that requires a little bit more thought, I'll uh, use it as fodder for next show. I, and I welcome topics, so feel free to shoot me emails on that. Uh, if we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Again, I can't thank you enough for showing up. You're welcome, Leon. Uh, to these shows. So again, everybody have a great weekend and we'll talk again. And then I uh, hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Smitty.